Can I start? Oh, yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for coming uh, one of the open forum of BN's working group for clarification of basic income definition. Uh, this session uh, deal with the topic of uh, threshold or basic need. Uh, we have three speakers in this short uh, 45 minute session uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, Chloe uh, Harpeni, uh, she is a social policy researcher and evaluator, and the co chair and co founder of the Basic Income Canada Youth Network, and also a PhD student at Queen's University. Her master research at the University of Cambridge leveraged participant experiences in the Ontario Basic Income Pilot to explore basic income through a feminist lens. And Ambi Ryan, uh, she had been uh, uh, advocate for the basic income and in, have been involved in basic income Ireland, and also uh, the author of uh, the book uh, called Enough is Plenty. And finally, myself, my name is Tori Amamori. Uh, I'm based in Kyoto, Japan, and uh, and money as a university professor, and uh, also serving uh, as a co-chair of the working group for clarification of basic definition. Uh, so let me uh, introduce a bit of background of this panel. Uh, so the, during the discussion uh, of the working group, uh, I realized in the current basic definition, a penny a month uh, Yeah, uh, penny a month uh, can be a basic income if uh, was that penny to be paid individually, universally, unconditionally, uh, it's basic income. However, uh, it, it would not be a basic income if we are to follow either initial usage of the term basic income in the early years and or common understanding of basic income in 1970s and 80s and also a uh, definition adopted by more than 10 regional affiliated BN. Uh, for this, uh, how affiliated BN define basic income, uh, Malcolm Tory, uh, long-term uh, committed uh, advocate, uh, had a great research. So how we are in this prior world? Yeah. So the... So, let me explain a bit about thresh my term threshold. Existence of some notion threshold, the level to be taken as minimum or as adequate, uh, like uh, there are many wording, but uh, for example, covering basic need or the cost of living, uh, corresponding to a sustain subsistence level and being adequate, uh, constant minimum, etc. And what is common among them is all of them presuppose a certain minimum threshold as essential component of basic income. Uh, here I use the term threshold as a shorthand for this minimum threshold. I do not mean to suggest the maximum threshold. So, uh, historically speaking, uh, it has always, uh, almost always this threshold. It is very difficult to pin down which one is the first usage of the term basic income uh, in the sense of unconditional income. But uh, I could put, I put several candidates, like the one is 1919, uh, Denis Miruna, uh, who has advocated the state bonus, uh, which is quite resembled to contemporary universal basic income, and he used in his second year of campaign in 1919, uh, basic minimum income. Or 1932, uh, there are Dutch debate, early debate, uh, almost early debate of the basis in com basis common. Uh, and, and there again, it comes with threshold. And 1979, uh, George Van uh, a uh, friend of uh, George Orwell in Eton and a student of John Maynard Keynes in Cambridge, uh, he sent a letter to Keynes and there, he advocated basic income. And in 1952, uh, eight years, 
uh, American institution economists uh, called for basic independent income. Again, uh, they are sufficient to cover the minimum substance, uh, like this in the early stage. And then, uh, as you might know, 1960s, 70s, there are uh, the time for either basic income or guaranteed income. Uh, those terms are loosely uh, interchangeably used. And there, again, uh, all come with threshold uh, signaled by word, like adequate, basic, minimum, etc. And then uh, academic definition and clarification started in 1980s, but in early period, uh, it comes with threshold like this. Uh, basic income research group, now it's called uh, Citizen Basic uh, Income Trust. Uh, in the first uh, period, when they found it in 1984, uh, like in this slide, it's come with a threshold uh, wording as sufficient to meet basic living costs. And also our organization, VM, when it founded in 1986, the secretary uh, sent out the letter to inform uh, the foundation BN and their basic income is worded as a guaranteed minimum income granted on an individual basis without mentis, no willingness to work requirement. And also uh, uh, one of the key person for forming BN, uh, Philip Van Paris, distinguish between basic income that is sufficient to cover a person's basic need from universal grant, which lacks such a threshold. So this uh, definition continue uh, in academia in 1990s and uh, also uh, in the 21st century until today. And as I said, uh, Malcolm Tory uh, did a great survey. Uh, more than 10 regional affiliate beyond have definition with this kind of threshold. And I just show uh, this is a home page of uh, Universal Basic Income Europe, UBIE, and high enough is one of the characteristics of defining basic income. And uh, this is uh, Basic Income Ireland. Uh, there are important characteristics sufficient to live a frugal but decent life. And uh, this is uh, basic income Canada network. Uh, I leave it to explain to Chloe later. And so those are there. But uh, there are invention of the North Threshold definition in the late 1980s. Uh, when VN uh, consolidated its statue in 1988, this threshold was dropped, but dropped. And uh, former BIRG now uh, Citizen Basic Income Trust also changed its definition in 1988 to 89 and again dropping threshold. And Van Paris himself, uh, early 80s, as far as I had a personal communication with Flip, uh, he embraced the concept with a threshold, but he called it, he didn't call it basic income. But, and then as I, as I show as a basic income, uh, he, he first thought it's come with a threshold, but uh, by the 1992, uh, he defined basically with a threshold. In showing this slide, 1989, he said basic income is sufficient to cover a person's basic need. This is one connotation of the basic basic income as it is standardly understood. But three years later, uh, he said basic income is not, however, meant to suggest link with so called basic need. So yes, so there are this diverse view, and uh, I don't know, it's a kind of conundrum. And that before going further, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Anne and Chloe uh, to uh, explain this, uh, some discussion in Ireland and in Canada. So now I'd like to hand over to Anne first. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks to Toro for inviting me to participate this morning. It's going to be quite a short uh, little input just to give you a flavor of the conversation about this um, subject in Ireland. I mean, I think, to be honest, we have always assumed 
that it should be a sufficient amount, that there should be a threshold. Just a few points before we start. I'm not actually representing Basic Income Ireland here today, but I have been involved since 2011, 10 of those years as joint coordinator. So I think I'm in a position to give a reasonable overview of our deliberations and conclusions so far on this subject of what a sufficient amount of basic income would be. Um, we don't we haven't really used the word threshold, but it's very uh, obviously it's connected. Um, and also at Basic Income Ireland, we don't have a party line as such. We don't expect our members, all our members, to to um, you know to always take the same view. But I think it's safe to say that for us, sufficiency is always part of the definition of a basic income. It's always sufficient, universal, and unconditional. In, the, in our conversations, we often talk about the ideal situation re regarding basic income, where um, our, our politicians across all parties would work together, decide to introduce basic income uh, in that universal, sufficient and unconditional definition over, say, the next few months. And then in that interim period, a citizens' assembly would be called together which would decide what the amount should be. And that, that assembly would draw on expert research about uh, minimum need, minimum amounts for, for a standard of living and draw on the views of the public. So that's the ideal, but um, really that's not going to happen any day soon. And then we have people within our organisation who strongly feel that until then, at Basic Income Ireland, we shouldn't offer an opinion about what the amount should be. That, but um, as somebody who's advocating and trying to communicate about basic income, it's my experience that most people don't actually know what basic income is. Some people think they know, uh, you know, they've heard the term, but they confuse it with minimum wage, living wage and so on. And so that we have a very big um, job of spreading the word and communicating what basic income actually is. And we take any opportunity we can to talk about it. And in those conversations, interviews, talks, whatever, um, it's impossible to address the subject without offering an opinion about the amount. The, the question of the amount will always come up. Um, so just to go back, as Taru already uh, referred to our website, uh, our front page says basic income would be enough to live a frugal but decent life without additional income. And at other places in the website, we use the word sufficient uh, instead of enough there. So just what would that be? Well, there are research has been done in Ireland, particularly by a group called the Vincentian Partnership. Um, and it has been calculated that a minimum essential standard of living uh, would be about 250 euros, would require 250 euros per week per adult individual. Um, now, clearly this is changing rapidly with, with inflation running high, but let's just stick with that figure for now. And indeed, to work by two of our Basic Income Ireland members um, has shown how we could pay this amount to everyone, how we could pay that MESL, the Minimum Essential Standard of Living amount, to everyone over 18. So that was John Baker, who's been cited by Toru already and I think is here today, and another uh, member called Dave Quinn. And they presented a paper on that uh, at this conference last year. So then we have another standard or well-known payment in Ireland, which is Job Seekers Allowance. And that is currently stands at 208 euros per week now. Today is actually budget day in Ireland, and it looks like that the amount will increase by about 12 euros, but it hasn't officially been announced yet. Um, and I think it's safe to say that most of our members would accept an introductory rate of basic income pegged to the job seekers allowance, but that we would not be satisfied to see an amount lower than that, than the job seekers allowance. Um, and we would be very clear that it was an introductory rate that would need to be reviewed and that should increase um, once the basic income principle was established and in action in, in Irish society. So I suppose the rationale behind that is that I and many others in Basic Income Ireland, we believe that the universal and unconditional nature of the payment would make a su sufficiently significant difference, even with this um, 
payment which doesn't reach the minimum st essential standard of living amount. Um, particularly the universality of the payment would mean that those who currently receive not, no payment from the state would now have an income. And combined with unconditionality, this would offer a new degree of freedom over current conditions. And of course, these are, are, are long established um, debates and conversations within the entire basic income community. So my personal hope, and I think this is shared by many, but I, I'll, I'll just say it as a personal hope here, is that if we could get the payment introduced universally and conditionally, even at this lower rate pegged to job seekers allowance, then more members of society would experience basic income in action and would understand it because understanding really is lacking at the moment. And then there would be a much wider demand for a sufficient payment and a much more informed debate could take place about it. And I just want to say one final point here is again, an argument familiar to all of you, I know, is that basic income should be one element of a social wage, that it shouldn't stand on its own. And of course, this affects the conversation about what a sufficient rate of basic income would be, because the quality and the range of the public services provided free to people at the point of use um, will also determine the adequacy or otherwise of a particular amount of basic income. So if the social wage is good, if it's high, that means that the cost of living um, is, is lowered. The amount of cash that people need to live well is lowered for people. So um, that's just a, an important point for me to, um, to conclude on. So again, thanks to you all and thanks to Toru. And I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, uh, for a brilliant uh, presentation. So now let me uh, invite uh, Chloe. Chloe is yours, Chloe. Um, okay, so I'll caveat this by saying it's 4.30 in the morning in Canada, and I'm feeling pretty sick the past couple of days. So it's not my best combination of factors, but I'm really happy to be here and chat a little bit more about the, the Canadian context and sort of what we have to offer on the, the threshold question. So thanks so much, Toru and, and Anne, for having me here. Um, I'll start off with some of the current definitions. Um, Canada actually has four national um, basic income advocacy groups, the Basic Income Canada Network, which is certainly um, the oldest. They've been around since, I believe, 2008. Um, but there's currently four groups that are all working really closely together and and all of all of whom's definition of the ideal basic income really has emerged or, or been informed by that of the Basic Income Canada Network. So I'm one of the co-chairs and co-founders of the Basic Income Canada Youth Network. Um, we work really closely with BICN, but but like Anne, I'm not speaking on behalf of, of any organization today. But just to say, and you'll see from some of the pieces that are highlighted in bold here, um, this idea of a threshold or some some form of minimum or standard um, is is really integral to the definitions of all four national groups um, currently involved in basic income advocacy in the Canadian context. So um, you'll see under BICN, uh, sufficient to meet basic needs and live with dignity and income floor, leaving no one receiving income support worse off, which we'll chat a little bit about, and substantially improving the well-being of those in deepest poverty. Um, BICYN, we've drawn heavily from BICN's definition and how we talk about basic income, but talking about a rate that is sufficient for recipients to pay for the necessities of life, participate meaningfully in their communities and live with dignity. Um, Coalition Canada, again, sufficient to eliminate income insecurity and dignity talking about how um, low rates currently are with, with existing social assistance programs in Canada um, and UBI works, um, it, mentioning keeping people out of poverty as a primary goal, which I think also implies some sort of, um, of minimum there. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between these definitions and ongoing work to sort of standardize them, but just to say that this idea of a threshold really, really is common um, across national advocacy and also subnational groups in the Canadian context. So looking backwards, um, the idea of a basic income in Canada really 
came about. Um, it was introduced actually by a premier in, in the 1930s and pretty quickly dismissed and, and to my understanding, didn't get much attention in the decades after that, but really kind of reemerged on the agenda in the late 1960s um, with a report that came from the Economic Council of Canada, which is a crown corporation, basically emphasizing how big of, big of an issue poverty actually was and really making that a little bit more visible to people than it had been before. Um, and basically what I'm hoping to, to demonstrate here is that the idea of a basic income in the Canadian context has always been really closely linked to poverty um, as, as, as a concern, as an issue, and as a potential solution or approach to addressing poverty. So um, the where basic income has sort of been played with or considered um, as a national policy proposal, it's always always really been as a function of poverty reduction or poverty relief alleviation um and this idea of of a threshold has sort of shown up uh, throughout time as a result of that so you'll see it in 1971 um this is a report that canadian advocates cite a lot that was um a special committee on poverty within the canadian senate that released a report that called for a guaranteed annual income that provides adequate income, um, which was established at 70% of what was then what that committee determined the poverty line to be, which was $3,500 for a family of four in 1969 um, or approximately $27,500 today. Um, really stark seeing 19, 1969 versus 2022 dollars, but um, regardless, you're, you're seeing some sort of amount come up there. Um, and then in, in 1974, when the agreement to launch the Manitoba pilot um, came about, um, Hum and Simpson in, in, in their article really, really highlight how this actually was closely connected again to this issue of poverty um, and ongoing conversations about how social assistance and social security programs were running in Canada. And again, you see um, this threshold that's, that's not too far off from what was identified in 1971. And in 1985, again, another report came about that proposed a universal income security program, which was a, a form of a basic income. It wasn't taken up um, in part because it received pretty widespread criticism from the labor movement and, and anti-poverty folks and others on the left because the amounts would have been really, really low. So... And looking to today, I've got a couple of different examples of just in the past um, really four or five years or so um, where basic income has sort of made a bit of a, of a splash or where there have been experiments or proposals and, and where this idea of a threshold or minimum have shown up there. So the Ontario basic income pilot, which ran um, for about a year from 2018 to 2019 before it was cancelled. Um, at that point, payments were based on the low income measure in Canada, which was um, at that time one of a couple of different uh, poverty measurements. Canada did not yet have an official poverty line at that point in time, but was based on being 75% of the low income measure. Um, and there was an explicit recommendation um, that the amounts be higher than what current social assistance programs were in the in the province. So I know I've got annual amounts there, but monthly Ontario works, um, which is sort of more traditional workfare is about $800 per month for a single and ODSP, which is a disability low income benefit was about $1,100. So you do see a pretty substantive raise from those amounts. Um, in 2019, BICN released their policy options report, which modeled a couple different versions of a basic income, but were all based on an annual individual amount of $22,000. Um, a couple years later in Prince Edward Island, which is Canada's smallest province, um, they commissioned a special committee on poverty who in their final report recommended a basic income um, that aligned the amount of a basic income with the market basket measure threshold, which um, at that time would have been just recently introduced as Canada's official poverty line. Um, and that was intended this, what they proposed was something that was bringing people to at a minimum of 85% of the threshold. So not even quite above the poverty line or at the poverty line, but quite a bit closer to it. Um, and Bill C233 and S233, we've had a couple of different um, 
proposals come forward in the House of Commons and Senate in the past couple of years around a basic income. But in 2021, these two came forward um, and emphasized a basic income that was livable, um, which has been really interesting to see that discourse sort of show up more and talking about um, actually in the framework to develop an uh, in the framework to develop a basic income, I'm doing some additional work around like what that amount actually should be. And finally, I'll just bring back um, some of my own research and some of the data that I found when speaking with participants in the Ontario pilot, um, where again, this idea of the threshold or a minimum was really emphasized over and over again. So I've just pulled a couple of quotes from, from my participants um, in my master's research here, but um, this idea of adequacy being really, really central in many people's perspectives to you know, what a basic income is or what a basic income should be. So you've got this quote. I remember going to these meetings when they were discussing it and they hadn't decided how it was going to be conducted. There was a lot of general agreement. It would have to be enough for people to live on and not feel like they're just surviving. It needs to be at a level where it's going to work for people. Um, you see this idea of, of improvement over the status quo. So um, several of the folks that I spoke with had previously been receiving provincial social assistance benefits. Um, and there was this pretty widespread notion that, well, of course, the basic income would need to be higher than, than those benefits were if they were to have any meaningful impact on poverty reduction. So especially for people on social assistance, that's way below the poverty level and it's not feasible for people to live like that. I think basic income would be good because it's a little higher than that, that social assistance program. Um, and people made really close, um, explicit implicit, and implicit connections between um, the amount of the basic income that they were receiving and the outcomes that they experienced as a result of receiving that basic income. So it wasn't just that people received a basic income and, and experienced positive outcomes because they were receiving a basic income. It was because they were receiving a basic income that was high enough for them to experience those outcomes. So for instance, the idea of giving people enough money that they could afford to pay their bills, eat healthy food, of being able to afford to participate in society. I wasn't so stressed. I wasn't thinking every second about spending money. I was able to survive comfortably. Um, so all of these, these, these um, ideas of, again, really connecting amount to outcomes. So just to wrap up, um, I think similar to, to sort of what Anne has shared, but in Canada, basic income has, has really always been closely tied to notions of sufficiency and adequacy um, and thresholds associated with poverty reduction goals are typically made implicit or explicit in Canadian policy research and advocacy um, and often have, have sort of achieved a taken for granted status. And I think this is, is uh, a result of lots of different reasons, but um, sort of basic income as a policy in Canada really originating in the political recognition of poverty. Um, the movement uh, in Canada has has strong roots in anti-poverty activism and lived experience. Um, other experiments and, and cash transfer policies in Canada have all established sort of precedents for thresholds. Um, we've got a bit of a tradition of using poverty measures as a proxy or benchmark for basic income amounts want to be improving on current income assistance programs, which we know are pretty bad and pretty low in, in Canada currently. Um, and I think we've, we've seen this sort of challenging of what, what Toru in his paper refers to as a logical rupture when you're assuming that certain outcomes are going to be met. Um, that also implies that, that the amount of a basic income would need to be at a certain minimum as well. So um, hopefully that made sense and uh, looking forward to chatting more. And thanks again for having me. Thank you, Chloe, a brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, so that initially, uh, I would like, I wanted to uh, invite uh, not only uh, Anna and Chloe, but also uh, some people who are against such a definition with threshold. And I assume uh, we, we would be allocated 60 minutes or 90 minute session, but it's <laughs> very short for 10 minutes. So I had to give up on that. But uh, let me introduce those voices, uh, why we shouldn't have uh, such a threshold. Uh, when uh, BIRG, uh, British uh, group, now C CBIT, it changed uh, their definition. Uh, the chair at the time, uh, Tony Walter, uh, explained uh, 
yes, this one, this right, explained uh, or labeled uh, organizations or definition with threshold as need based definition. And he uh, claimed, uh, he explained there are three weaknesses of such a definition. Uh, the first one is determination of basic need and the cost is extraordinarily difficult. And second, such a definition makes BI harder to sell. And third, uh, such a definition is too narrow. And uh, just let me uh, explain this first too. Yes, it is very uh, difficult to determine uh, the exact amount, but uh, having a minimum threshold in the definition is different thing to having exact amount in the threshold. It's something like, it's similar to like having uh, the characteristics of unconditionality is uh, different from how that unconditionality would be interpreted or how individual basis or, or having the characteristic of the individual basis is different from how uh, that individual basis is uh, treated uh, in reality, like how should we make a bank account of 10 months old and give it to that baby or can I give it to uh, main main carer of that baby? Uh, those difficult issues arise, but still we can have an uh, individual basis. So the, yes, there are some counter argument for this first one, but I'd like to hear how they think. And also makes harder to sell, yes, maybe a penny amounts can be basic income. It's really easy to sell. But again, Chloe uh, mentioned my paper. Uh, there are kind of logical uh, rupture. Uh, this taken from an organization which whose definition allow a penny a month a basic income, but in that organization, such a penny a month can provide a secure financial platform to build on and some other things, which their uh, concept of basic need was some threshold uh, already implicitly presume, but it's not acknowledged. So there are kind of logical rupture. And also in my paper published uh, in the basic chemistry studies, I mentioned some other uh, things, but today I skip it. Uh, the bottom line is, yes, we have two, both I think reasonable uh, definition related to the threshold one, with threshold, the other with a threshold, and uh, we would like to uh, think about it uh, collectively. So now uh, I'd like to make this discussion open to uh, floor. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, may I uh, start with a submitted question? Oh, uh, Malcolm is here. Yes, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, should I read or Malcolm, can you read or? No, probably I should read. Uh, sorry for my bad English, but I read for Malcolm's, Malcolm Tory's question. Uh, a question for Anne. Has micro simulation been conducted on the 2000, uh, sorry, 250 euros proposal to show that the combination of the basic income and the funding mechanism would not impose net disposal income uh, loses on the low income household? If so, might it be possible to receive a copy of the micro simulation research result? Uh, that thank you, and thank you, Malcolm. Um, Malcolm, I'm not qualified to answer that question um, here, but John Baker, who was the author of the, the paper I referred to, may have something to, he'd like to put in the in the chat box, or it might be, and ov obviously, um, uh, we could, you know, you and he and I could correspond on it, but right now I'm not able to answer that question. Thank you. And <laughs> I don't know how to turn down my slide, but anyway, oh, is there any other question? I had asked me a question, Toru, but I tried to write a response and thought that I would be able clearly not very good at this platform yet but i thought that i'd be able to think about it a couple of times but it i got to answer one sentence and it was one and done but um, malcolm was asking how many of the proposals and experiments that i've discussed conform to bn's definition of basic income as an unconditional income for every individual and then points pointed to the ontario pilot as something that was income tested 
um, as well as household tested income. So not sort of a, a, a pure basic income, I guess. And then I just responded and said, yes, that Canada <laughs> goes rogue on the basic income definition in a couple of different ways. Um, including the fact that we're most typically talking about a negative income tax model and something that is targeted on the basis of income. So I put that, I responded that, but I'll say it in case people can't see where that lives. Oh, thank you, uh, Chloe. And now we have a new question by uh, Johanna, Johanna uh, Arori, hope I'm pronouncing name properly. Uh, how do we make basic income a share in stock exchange worldwide? One dollar share, the lendite is symbolic reducing extremely poverty and safe society from conflict to a civil war. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Is Arno, Chloe, uh, would you say something on this? I, yes, I, I would like to know more about what Johanna um, is thinking. I, I, I have a sense that she has, has given this some thought. You know, I don't. I again, I don't think it's something I'm able to address. Possibly Chloe is. Um, it might be. I <laughs> it might be useful to hear more from from Johanna about it. I'm pretty good. Johanna, can you say something more? Okay, uh, waiting to uh, Johanna could write some additional context on her question. Uh, we have for this six minutes from now. So is there anything you'd like to, you wanted to say, but yet you haven't, uh, Anne or Chloe? I cut off Chloe there a moment ago. So I think she may have something to say. I was just saying that I didn't have anything to, to add to Johanna's question either, unfortunately. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, yes, Mark Malcolm is here. And Malcolm uh, uh, gave several uh, important contribution to the definition issues. And there uh, we need a uh, rational discussion. When we use the term basic income, but each speak in a different way, it is very difficult to have uh rational conversation they fully agree with malcolm and uh, at the same time uh like uh, malcolm's question to chloe uh, malcolm asked uh did canada conform uh, can uh, conform a bien's uh, definition uh it is very difficult now because basic income is not invented by uh, Bien or invented by a particular theorist, a philosopher, it's a kind of uh, collective intellectual effort. Uh, it is very difficult to just adopt one definition and uh, prohibit to use as a way. Uh, like the term freedom and equality, people use different way. In such a case, rational com conversation can be possible uh, each occasion we have to be careful in which sense we or some other party, other people or use definition. And this threshold is one of those issues. Some people think uh, basic income uh, should come with a certain threshold. Some people don't at the end, haven't such a threshold. Some in the end uh, mm -hmm. say it's this kind of uh, definition with threshold, the fraud definition, but it's very difficult to these are either 100% or 0% argument. That's my uh, taking, but maybe people have different takings. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything to say, Anne or uh, Chloe? I'm, I'm just, um, if I may come back again, just uh, with reference to Malcolm's first question. I mean, in our basic income group, 
we are always very careful to say that with, af, with the introduction of a basic income, nobody should be worse off than they already are. And that very careful, you know, you can't just, uh, this is the way I would speak about it in public. I'm obviously not speaking as technically and using the technical language that Malcolm would use and other experts, but we would say that there need, would need to be very careful scrutiny of, of circumstances to ensure that nobody would be worse off than they currently are under a basic income system so that there would be no let, net losses, particularly on, say, single parents or, or low income households. Um, so I just want to, re to refer back to that, that we are aware of, the, of that possibility. Um, but I'm not in a position to give any detail on it here. Thank you. And the idea is there are two questions. One, uh, one by John Baker. Uh, one of uh, Tor's part the argument is that we cannot consider a uh, miracle payment to be a basic income. This solve at least that problem if we include the following condition. The payment must be substantive. Uh, it must have a significant impact on people's well-being. Though I personally would prefer a definition including uh, adequacy. Uh, and also, because the time is less than three minutes now, so I also would like to introduce that a question by oh, Furui, uh, Furui Chan. Uh, she, uh, her question is uh, China gives everyone over 60 years old uh, 10 yuan. Uh, 70 plus 200 yuan, uh, 80 plus 300 yuan. No other unconditions, probably no other conditions. It's interesting. Maybe the basic income can be small in the beginning, but not like one cent uh, by free cent. Oh, thank you. So th this is rather of a comment. And thanks for, you for uh, uh, information about China. And I'd like to know more. And that's related to John's uh, question as well. Is there any, either Anne or Chloe would like to answer or say something on this? I have, I have much to add, but I um, just to, to John's question, I, I yeah, I, I think the the adequacy or significant impact. I like I like the significant impact on people's well being. Um, framing. I think it, it's interesting because we've always, from what I've seen and, and what I'm seeing now, like the, there's a pretty intentional effort to tie a proposed basic income amount to poverty measures. Um, and Canada just recently adopted an official poverty line a couple of years ago, which I know like a lot of research and work went into. Um, but the, the sort of challenge that kind of emerges there as well is the uh, you know, what's going to have a significant impact on people's well-being depends on lots of different factors. And so our poverty line right now is different across different cities and areas across the country. Um, not substantially, but like different enough where if you're living in a really expensive urban area, the poverty line is uh, higher than it would be somewhere else. So I guess I just, the, the adequacy I think the adequacy question is an important one, but obviously I think it complicates things as well. That's all I would add. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, Anne, is there, would you like to say some final word? Yes, thanks to, for all those great comments. Um, and yeah, for John and Rui, uh, uh, the last one, I'm not sure if I got that name right. But yes, and also Chloe's final comment there uh, does refer also is relevant to my my final comment in my slides about the social wage about the level of the social wage and uh, how that can i mean that's relevant in all the discussions now about the rising cost of living is that a, a really good social wage can bring down the actual amount of money that people need to spend so um, we would always in basic income ireland be very clear that basic income is is one element of a good social wage and part of a range of suite of services. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So the well, it's almost time. Well, uh, I would like to answer John and Fruy, but probably I know both of you, so that I'd like to send an email maybe. So uh, uh, thank you for coming, uh, uh, all of you uh, here.
uh, and uh, input question and our hearing, listening. And also, uh, thank you, Anne and Chloe, uh, to be in this panel. Uh, and also, uh, Selma was helping, uh, has been helping uh, this session technically. Uh, thank you very much, Selma. So uh, I would like to uh, close uh, uh, this session. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye.